Hello and welcome everyone. Today is Thursday, July 21st. It is our second community call of the week uh, and excited to chat with folks today. Uh, we've been having an offline uh, beginning conversation about where is the best pizza in the world, uh, which is obviously the important stuff. Uh, but uh, we're now transitioning to some research and public goods, which I, I guess we can spend some time on as well. Um, but the goal for today in general, I have some stuff that I, I'd be happy to chat about uh, in terms of thinking about research public goods. And right, part of what we're doing, you know, our core mission here at SCURP is facilitating between the worlds of like pure theory and pure application. And is obviously a oversimplification of the state of the world. But, you know, between the, the thinkers and doers, the, the researchers and builders, however we split that dichotomy, or, or try to signify that there's people who are more interested in just the underlying theory, and then there's more people uh, interested in building things that people actually interact with. And how do we continuously tighten the gap between those and facilitate meaningful exchange of knowledge and interaction between those buckets? And so as part of that, I think a question that uh, we're slowly starting to explore more and more are, well, what are the actual public resources that get created as that, right? And that can be something as straightforward as, we're an organization that's had to be existent and growing in some kind of way and operating for, you know, going on 18, 19 ish months. Um, we have processes, right? Like that open sourcing, some of those things can be a public good. And we've been doing some of that. And I know, especially with Rich and his background, it comes from uh, places that like that is the norm because it's helping in open source development. And that's really exciting. And uh, I, I love part of why I'm personally in this world is because of that kind of open source ethos and sharing and not just thinking of, oh, we made a thing, so now let's close it off from the world and think of how we personally benefit. It's immediately, hey, let's share this and see how we can collectively build more than any of us would have been able to build individually. And so I realized initially, I think we tweeted about the fact that we were, we were going to potentially discuss two things, one around network mapping, which we've started talking about a little bit. Uh, I wanted to give the uh, just folks in the community a general update with the audit database project and where we're headed with those, uh, with both of those two things, especially because those are now, we just got approved for capstone projects uh, at uh, Heinz College this fall as of right now for both of these. So that's really exciting of, you know, these are gonna get uh, resourced up uh, with, with four to six grad students each. So that's super exciting to actually have more support and it's all built in this open source way. Uh, and then we've already been working on the open problems in Dow Science List with, uh, with Metagov and with Dow Research Collective. Uh, and now uh, our cross-pollination team with Fotis and Hazel, they're starting to do some additional uh, research directly with folks uh, in terms of actually sourcing specific uh, open problems and how we can better help people uh, solve issues with those kinds of problems. We're about to start a survey sur uh, capturing open problems in smart contract auditing and thinking about what more we can do there. Um, so yeah, I, I'm excited to, to at least present a little bit about those. I also do want to give a chance if anyone does have any particular things either at SCURF or what's going on in the world, uh, if there's any particular burning questions on your mind, uh, please feel free to drop those in chat, raise your hand. Definitely happy to add additional or, or just go in a, a slightly different direction at a tangent. Uh, if that is exciting to the community as well. Uh, and of course, please raise your hand, drop questions, comments as I'm going along. Uh, I always prefer discussion as opposed to monologuing, uh, which might, I, I don't know if everyone believes me when I say that given the amount of monologuing, but I, I swear I prefer discussions more. Um, so yeah, please jump in and I'd love to turn this more into a conversation and I will do my best to pepper in some questions uh, or discussion points along the way. Um, so yeah. I'll give it a moment in case anyone has anything uh, that burning that they want to throw it out immediately. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and talk about sort of these three separate buckets between network mapping, audit, open problems, and go from there. That seems like a good enough uh, silence for a community recorded call. So I'll go ahead and get started. And again, please feel free to uh, cut me off with the virtual raise hand or to uh, just drop a question or comment in chat and I will address those as they come in. So yeah, I think right in this broad sense of our mission and what we're trying to accomplish, we have these rough stakeholders, right? People generating ideas, people trying to apply ideas to the world. These two groups aren't always fully aware of what's happening in each other's domains and even what are the relevant things to pull from each side, right? And uh, I know this is one that, uh, that Rich and I both like mentioning of uh, like when I just got into the space in 2016, 
you know, you're in DAO circles, the amount of times a co-op got brought up and people are like, hey, what's a co-op? What is that? Or you'd think people building DAOs would know about that and would have that, you know, the full history of cooperative ownership and everything uh, in their minds already as they're trying to build. And that wasn't the case because it was such early days. And, you know, we've had some discussion. I actually had a catch up today with a, a PhD who's uh, transitioning her usable privacy and security focus into specific usable privacy and security and smart contract audit development. Um, and so we were chatting with her around how much she's seeing that there are standard practices and security for code development, code review, all of these things that exist for decades now and have a ton of literature. Not all of it has been ported over, even the most logical stuff. And so, right. And that's not because people look at it and they're like, oh, that's older, that's the tradition, or that's web two. So, you know, we want to break that and we want to spit in it. People just don't always know, or they're so busy that they forget that a thing existed because they just are so heads down with whatever pressures are in front of them. So what are the kinds of things that we can be adding to help people understand what are the relevant places that they should be looking towards? And in regards to that, I'm really excited to think about this network mapping project. Because as we can figure out, not just ourselves to generate of like, here's our network mapping person, and they are responsible for ever mapping everything, like that's just not going to work. But if we can actually seed a public, uh, a public good, a public resource, and build a community and culture around contributing to it, then we can actually have a living, breathing series of network maps in the underlying databases that feed them that can be super useful to anyone thinking, whether it's funding research, whether it's finding collaborators, whether it's just like, hey, I wanna go geek out on a topic, who has produced the most on cryptography in the last 12 months, right? All of these different kind of views that can actually really become possible. And I know a number of players are starting to independently do this, and I'm really hopeful that we can be this kind of convener to build out whatever is the public version of this, to say, hey, why are we having these things in our, our private silos, even if it's just because we're so busy because we haven't had a chance to share it publicly, how do we convert that into it? Um, and so with this network mapping, you know, we're going to start with just scraping a publicly available research API, so Google Scholar API or similar things where we can say immediately just pull since the Bitcoin white paper came out until, you know, whatever day this is being done, let's just pull out all the research. And then from all the research we've pulled out, let's actually try to tag things that are relevant to the content categories on our forum, right? So that's going to be a whole fun exercise on its own, right? Because defining the lines of what is and isn't governance research or what is and isn't mechanism design or crypto economics, that's going to be much thornier than what is or isn't scaling or uh, consensus or cryptography, right? Especially once you step away from like hard science, hard math into things that just have more open-ended complexity to them uh, and like human elements. Yeah, boundary lines are, are very tough. <laughs> yeah, that, that's... Yeah, the Lord of the Rings version of an open lit review. Um, but yeah, sort of right. We, we don't want to take on foolish fool's errands and endeavors that are like inherently unconquerable. Um, but at the same time, there is a close approximation that we can get to that can actually be a living, breathing, useful thing for folks. And finding that balance is going to be really key in exploring. Uh, because yeah, if we, you know, if we cast even a hundred person well-resourced team of like map everything ever perfectly and do it in this hyper dynamic way, that's just setting up for failure. But if it's, you know, can we capture 80, 90% uh, and have a mechanism to somewhat consistently drip, that, that feels much more feasible and much more conquerable. Uh, and also just recognizing that like nothing is perfect here. Uh, you know, every second there's new stuff coming out and capturing that is just impossible. Um, so here I think we're, you know, we're going to start with this general exercise of uh, let's see what data we can get out there. Uh, what is necessary to categorize? What's the kind of social network graphs that can be built as a result of that by category, by institution? What are the interesting things we can see of, well, where has cryptography stuff been coming out of? And I'm picking cryptography specifically because it, in my opinion of the Web3 research domains, cryptography is and I, please push back on me if you don't think this is true, but in my view, cryptography is probably the most where the advances have actually come from academia, right? If you look at something like governance on the opposite end, most of it has come from informal blog posts, people tinkering with some stuff, deciding, ah, I need a thing, let me crank something out and just put it up and then copy paste, etc. right? Some things have come from Vitalik's blog or Twitter or other spaces, whereas some things have come through very formal channels. So obviously, as we're starting this mapping exercise, only the formal channels are going to be easy for us to map. How to successfully integrate Twitter into this kind of mapping uh, is going to be its own fun future problem to deal with. And what are all the informal sources of knowledge 
that as far as the knowledge base, right, formal in terms of uh, formal informal in terms of academic publishing, right, if, if uh, uh, like MIT or any journal uh, is looking at it, right, of course, a blog is informal relative to them. But for us, we don't care about that formality and formality. We care about is information relevant. And that's a different element. And like, that's going to be tougher to capture of the full set of relevant information. So that to me feels like a fool's errand of the goal of like, oh, relevant information to Web3 will be in a single database. Like that, that seems hyper unrealistic. But can we at least start mapping the academic networks? Because those are more clearly open sourceable. They're in APIs. Uh, they're in single domains that we can't actually scrape and go through. And use that as the beginnings to understand, well, where has certain type of research come from? And use that as a conversational point with our community and with anyone else who wants to collaborate with us on this to think of, well, for scaling or for auditing or for oracles or for any other topic, what unique sources of information exist that have been very influential on those domains and how do we actually bake those into this kind of mapping exercise? So I personally see this mapping exercise as this is really our pilot project between now and the end of the year. You know, from now through the end of the summer, it's kind of mapping what is our full goal with this capstone who is going to be working on it and supporting. And I thank you to the folks who have DM'd and mentioned an interest in, in collaborating on this. I'll, uh, within a few weeks, once we're actually more concretely planning this, I'll, I'll absolutely be pulling all y'all in to have discussions. Um, but right, we're figuring out, now it's get ready for the capstone. Then we have a capstone. Uh, and the network mapping in of itself does not feel like the most powerful thing. But I feel like it starts getting much more powerful once we pair it with things like open problems lists, right? If we hear, see, here's the people who are dealing with issues, and here's people working on relevant research domains and problems. That already starts becoming an interesting matchmaking exercise, right? And like that already starts getting to the kind of facilitation that I'm hoping these resources can actually help us accomplish. So before I get into the open problems list or the audit database, I'll pause for a moment in case anyone does want to bring up anything on the network mapping side. So there were a couple of comments I didn't read. Yeah, government does a lot of cryptography too, absolutely. I mean, that was its own. For anyone who wants to nerd out on the history of cryptography, uh, the nature of government slowly opening up its hands off of cryptography was also a very interesting point. Because when uh, like Diffie-Hellman and some of the OGs for cryptography and PKIs and the things that are needed for us today in Web3, uh, when they did that stuff at IBM and other private institutions, there was a whole wide discussion as to whether or not they could even tell anyone about their research. and um, I think it was the precursor to MI6 was actually doing a lot of similar stuff and NSA and them had to figure out how to share and whatever. It brings up its own whole world of stuff. But yeah, Chris, I see you have your hand up, so please jump in. Yeah, one of the reasons I've been a proponent of mapping is um, it allows a visual representation to become a unified, uh, effectively Rosetta Stone for a project so people can understand what's happening, where it's happening, why it's happening, and have those things have uh, a relationship between each unit and each action explained. Um, so one of, one of the maps um, that I made for the Pan-African Grants Program and effectively for the Regional Grants gets into how to break these things down in order to create a structured approach that is reproducible so that we have a way that we are identifying gaps in the research um, and then ultimately figuring out who is able to fill those gaps concerning their specialty and how their specialty relates to those gaps is you know cryptography is a perfect example of uh, we need to identify someone who is uh, familiar with cryptography in order to do research in cryptography or to do a case study on cryptography. Um, but ultimately, it it's not it was not clear the usefulness of maps at first when when I started pushing like why we need to map things within our organization, but outs like we need internal maps and external maps. And the more dynamic these maps are, the more accurately they can reflect what's happening in real life at the time. So ultimately, we could be able to construct a map. So if someone comes in to like scurf the IO, they could see exactly what's happening within our organization. 
And conversely, with the way that this literature review analysis is being done, we can create a map of where everything came from, but also what's happening now. Obviously, I think that's the goal to say, oh, this DAO is working on this, this research is happening here, and have it in more of a cohesive map. But the issue becomes the, the perspective. There needs to be uh, the macro versus the micro. So it's like you can zoom in or zoom out. And I think the issue becomes we just have to have the different layers of perspective identified so we're not trying to do 10,000 foot level stuff in the micro layer where it should have been something that's in the macro layer so i think it's just an issue of like articulating macro versus micro internal versus external and then the maps become clear as to what content is being analyzed within that map as to why it doesn't include everything but ultimately they can be linked together to get to a point where it is like well this macro map that is the ten thousand foot view links to the micro map over here that is the more dynamic analysis on the local level or even geolocated um, so that's where again it's like <laughs> mapping is not necessary but it helps specifically when our organization is trying to create cohesion between parallel organizations that aren't necessarily aware of each other having a map that brings these things to one unified uh, representation makes it easier to present the relationship as to how I can say, oh, these two organizations are working in parallel, but they're not working together because they haven't established a relationship. But once we establish a relationship, the updated map, map could reflect, oh, these two have partnered. Um, and this is where a dynamic map is obviously more uh, useful than something that is not constantly updated. For sure, yeah, and I appreciate you both mentioning kind of the different uh, dimensions of mapping and that that's its own thing to get more nuanced over time is thinking, you know, what are we trying to map from the macro to the micro and how do those connect to each other? Because again, like a single map, even if it's hyper dynamically updated and whatever, that's not as great as a web of interconnected maps that can actually help navigate through different elements of very related information. And I know one thing that came up today uh, in a separate call uh, was that we kind of realized that like, hey, we're hearing two DAOs potentially start very similar research projects and we're unsure of it, whether or not they're connected to each other. And fortunately, we're in a position where someone here is involved in one DAO and knows the people involved in the other DAO, so they can just be the one to connect the dots there and make sure it all happens. Right, but what if we what if we didn't have that one person where we heard about that second DAO doing that thing, right? So that's also where it's a place of like, hey, are you as an institution about to start spending a ton of money and time on a project? You want to double check no one's doing anything like that before, anything like that? Um, so I, I do think elements along those line uh, will be very helpful as well, and that's where I do hope it can really benefit uh, the industry as a whole. Um, so yeah, anyone else have any other, uh, and, and yeah, thank you for putting together those maps as well, because those are great, Chris. Uh, but yeah, does anyone have any other uh, kind of thoughts or anything that they want to share about network mapping at Scurf specifically, the benefits of it broadly, kind of anything relating to network mapping uh, as a public good in terms of the Web3 research space? I have a question, and it's about the content of the maps. So network mapping seems to me to be a very Web2 activity unless you're adding additional layers of information on top of it. So like the strength of the connections or the ways in which things are dynamically moving or some additional information that's not just a map. So like what are, what are the implications? Where are the val like, is there a values layer that can be added? So I'm curious about those pieces of thinking about network mapping. Yeah, and that's exactly what we have to kind of figure out in the next uh, four to six-ish weeks is, is particularly what, are, what is realistic to try to capture there that is immediately helpful without creating this into too big of an endeavor for four months. Um, because I, I very much agree of like just the single layer of like, here's the research that was produced, period, of like, well, that's not as great. 
if we don't actually understand, well, let's view like what else, how can we pull of like co-authorship and what is the show about the social networks around the research and how connected are people around different products that are happening? Or, you know, you mentioned like strength of connection. How do we capture that? How do we actually start signifying of that? How do we then start connecting, right? Maps of people on the academic side with maps of here's what people doing industry counterpart with maps of open problems list. So I think eventually like the complexity here is going to uh, interestingly get, uh, uh, yeah, just keep growing. Um, I do not have a clear sense of what that looks like. And I, I know Stephanie, that's something that, uh, that I definitely want to chat with you about. Uh, and if anyone else has particular thoughts and has been in that environment where you've actually had to think about how do you make these kind of maps as useful to the ecosystem and community as possible? And what are all those elements of, uh, of uh, metadata and data analysis or whatever else that can be done to provide more useful insights as opposed to, well, here's the thing, go figure it out and like, just go make the most of it. And yeah, how, how do we actually get it to a point where it is continuously evolving to be as impactful as possible? Uh, and a whole separate rung here is right, let's say we do somehow perfectly as of today, we've mapped all research in existence relevant to Web3, even if it's officially Web3, tangentially related, let's just for a thought experiment for a moment, assume that was somehow possible to do, right? Even if we did that, great, it was updated as of this morning, it's not anymore, right? So then there's the whole other element of, well, how do you actually make this a living, breathing communal activity? And that's where I'm also really interested to, over the long term, how do we connect this to university clubs and the incentives we put in front of academics? And how do we create an easy way to say, hey, if you plug your own research into here, it can help you get be more discoverable to all of the funders in our space who want to fund research in that domain you can then be more discoverable to all the people who are looking for partners in crime on a new research endeavor or in you know industry academic collaboration on problems or whatever so i think the only honest answer i can give that would be succinct is we don't fully know where this is headed yet and so trying to guess all of it feels very challenging what i just rambled through is kind of my honest view of it at the moment uh but yeah i do just see part of it is creating the environment where cool things can arise and we can immediately capture them into the structure that we're building without trying to be overly prescriptive. But yeah, Chris, please jump in. Oh, sorry. Within data lakes or data oceans, uh, scraping becomes one of the most useful tools concerning um, gathering useful information and putting it together into something that reflects an analyzed uh, chunk of data. And I'll, I'll allude to something like an identity. Like we think of identities as this tangible thing, but really it's like abstract and scattered among a bunch of different organizations. So like my college degrees aren't under the same institution as my social security number, as my driver's license number as my passport so my identity is actually scattered around a bunch of different places so the better something is able to scrape different institutions to gather those pieces of metadata about my identity the more it can construct a more whole uh, interpretation of what exists out there um, so i think that's where it's like understanding that scraping data together is an important part of gathering all of the, the relevant information because it's not just about gathering information it's about gathering relevant information and excluding irrelevant information so this is where it's like it's a specifically information scraping that i think is one of the the things we have to be cognizant about but also make us a, a very explicit part of our process for sure yeah that absolutely makes sense photos i see you also have your hand up please jump in yeah something like that uh to, at least in my mind sounds like cross-pollination tooling there's tooling for various kinds of activities and this seems like uh is something that could uh specifically fit to the needs of building this ecosystem uh level 
network of connections and maintaining them. Uh, and I'm, I don't know, like there's a big technical problem here as, uh, as well as a very big uh, normative issue. Uh, like what kind of real time data would be even relevant here? Uh, and can this process of figuring out what's, what is relevant, what is not, is autom can, uh, can this be automated in itself? Um, because like this seems like if we aim for having like the dynamic maps, then this like there's so much data and so much information that um, like who would work on that? Would it be like a machine? Will it be outsourced to AI or will it be like a whole uh, will be actual labor from people? And this becomes more like a um, project like that, that, that would actually be uh, an ecosystem wide interdao project the, the way I see it. Uh, and But it seems like there's an interesting uh, direction towards that. <laughs> the, the scare for starting. This seems like uh, if more organizations get on that, it will be a very big thing that we can actually align various uh, ecosystem players together. Yeah, but that was like a word salad. Right? <laughs> Thanks for uh, uh, jumping very in, in photos. Yeah. I yeah, appreciate you sharing. Uh, Paul, I see you got your hand up. Please jump in. Yeah, from uh, what Fotis was saying, like I think we are in word salad category anyway, right? We're kind of in like some levels of abstraction. Um, but one of the things that he was just mentioning, um, and also one of the things that you had mentioned earlier, Eugene, kind of got me thinking, like what, like a uh, question of what is dynamic here? And one of the things I think that we have to be aware of in helping to create these maps and articulating what these relationships are um, that while we as an organization are doing our very best to not be prescriptive it is impossible to be generating these maps right because um, without there being some type of take or some type of uh, human connection um, and uh, for lack of a better word a narrative of how these things are connecting each other right we are adding that um, there is not a fully and completely neutral way that human beings could do that thing, right? Like we are basically saying here is the systems that we see or here are the interconnections that we see. I do think that there's some interesting tooling questions here of how could that be AI assisted, but I think to Fotis's point, um, it will probably be a mixture. There's like human decisions to be made here about what these maps look like and what these relationships look like. And the reason why I also want to bring up the, you know, you can't not influence these things is a i want that to put that on our our minds like we're not making fully neutral things but, but b like once you kind of recognize that you can take some ownership there i think some of the dynamic things that could be valuable about these maps or some of the the, the human layer that we could add to some of these maps is how can you help people kind of redirect and we can kind of collaboratively create these redirection types of maps um, i'm starting from a place of kind of research maps right there are and this is a i think a problem in academia because of um publishing biases and all that um but there are avenues of research that are probably not worth going down anymore right collectively we can kind of map those out like oh nope there's a bunch of null this way like you're on a path to null you can continue to go down this path of null but why um, unless you have a good reason um, i don't have maybe as good a example in kind of the you know, how do we map the connections or, or networks of people? But there are probably some people who think, you know, it'd be really good if I was connected to people who were in X part of the industry or who study X type of stuff in uh, academia. And if we had this kind of dynamically and collaboratively created kind of mapping types of tools, then instead we can be like, we, I hear what you're saying, but what you actually mean is this. And so um, I think we do kind of have to a little bit own a, that that's a thing that we would be doing, like we wouldn't really be doing it neutrally, but B, that that's a thing that we can be doing and that that's a service and that maybe some of those dynamic and AI assisted types of mapping capabilities. Yeah, oh, please, Chris. Um, I, like, I 
completely agree on all those points. And I just want to, I don't know if like we should be trying to say that anything's neutral in the sense of like, we could argue about this, but I'm not sure if usefulness is philosophically neutral and it is philosophically biased. Like this is useful to someone. And especially when we're talking about figuring out if something is useful to humans, like completely automating it seems like not the direction anyway, in the sense of if an algorithm is completely automated, it needs to consult with the human to make sure this is output is actually useful to a human, which is where automation actually starts drifting away from uh, intention and alignment. It, and this is where a hybrid of human and automation is like usually the best combination, even for intrusion, like intrusion detection systems specifically, um, like the best output is from a comb it's like a hybrid. It's not like all automated or all human, it's a hybrid. So there's points need that could be automated, but if we're trying to determine if something is useful to a human, full automation is like ensuring that it drifts from whatever the baseline point is from to the future. So that's where it's like, there's automation at points, but to ensure that the alignment is continuous, it needs to be checked with human quality because again quality is something that changes it's not a static line and quantity is why where like we can always have a static line with quantity because it's mathematically finite whereas quality fluctuates and this is specifically something it fluctuates within individuals and especially between groups over time um so this is where if we're talking about quality qualitative input and qualitative survey is always going to be important and useful to ensure that usefulness is there which is where the notion of like an automated thing that uh, uh, expects quality but never checks in with the human this is why if you don't update your like thumbs up on your pandora it starts to drift on your playlist that's exactly like a perfect example of where if you don't constantly update the quality control check it starts to drift over time. For sure. No, thank you for bringing up that important point. And just Kate, before handing it off, just a quick comment there. Um, I mean, I think that this like element of the, the technical and automatable through the human and recognizing that this is all part of the solution, it's not either or, and sort of what are the balances at different points is super important, right? Because we're talking about network mapping, which is one project, but network mapping is not meant to be an isolated project. Network mapping is meant to sit alongside the cross-pollination team project whatever it is we're building out in that direction because that's starting from the other direction right because from the tools perspective it's network maps it's audit database it's public things that we can just put out there and see how we can most automate and alongside that right all of scurf is a human layer right we're building networks we're trying to bring the humans together in focused areas and i'm hopeful that cross pollinators or the the function of cross pollination and whatever roles that will entail in the future um that will be a whole mix of different kinds of human interactions to either support certain tools that are trying to, to be on the automation side, right? In the future state, there might be people just dedicated to collaborating with network maps and being like, oh, but here's what you're missing from the actual industry. Like, here's not what's being caught in that data. Um, and then other people might just totally play different roles of like knowledge dissemination, acquisition, sharing. And I think the whole other thing, and once we'll segue to the open problems is, in my opinion, the only way we can get open problems is if we just did like the best surveys in the world and made it automated and perfect consistency and frequency and empirically driven uh, length and timing and like every detail, it's still not gonna be the same as getting a bunch of people in a room and just having a conversation with them, like an honest facilitated workshop. And so that's where it's like, there's the tools that we can automate. There's the mix of like tools and humans that we can bring together live for virtual or in-person facilitation. And then there's like humans that we can task with ongoing roles. And like, what is the mix of these kinds of activities that we can always be pulling from like pure or tending towards more automation, tending more high touch, purely human. And what are all the ways that the, those lines get blurry in the middle? Uh, but yeah, I'll stop there and Pietro, please jump in. Hi guys, hi everyone. Uh, so just just a question and uh, maybe a question to clarify. Uh, I'm not into the conversation, but if I understand well, so I'm a new user, uh, I click a link, I open an interface, a web page open, and I have a graph, a network, 
where each dot is uh, a who, so someone who is doing something. And I do have the information on how they are doing it or why they're doing it. And that node is connected to other nodes uh, that are other actors that uh, uh, play a role in that. Is this the understanding, the correct understanding of a network map? So, yeah, so to the way at least I'm envisioning it in the context of this very specific capstone project that we're starting with CMU uh, in about a month and a half or two is that we scrape databases that have actual research we categorize that data into some kind of database with pointers to the original research last thing i want us doing is trying to like catch those pdfs on our database somewhere because that just opens up a whole bunch of issues so database with pointers to outside but really it's going to be a data uh, cleanliness and tagging exercise and how do we most appropriately tag that information so that we can then create that graph into some simple uh, way that people can then assess that social network graph and view by topic, by research, um, or by research and where each node is individually a person. That is just the starting point. So I think the, the, the more the philosophical and wider conversation of network mapping and its role in the space, I think that's something that we kind of stepped into a much wider kind of future discussion of where this could head. Uh, but at least in the context of what I'm hoping to see by the end of the year, that's kind of my the extent of my ambitions because I know the data tagging on that is going to be a monstrously annoying activity. So like I, I don't want to be overly ambitious on the UI and lots of it and how does it look and how do people interact. Like there's a version where it takes four months just to clean that thing up in the first place, and that's just like step one to building the first map. Um, so yeah, I, I don't want to be overly prescriptive of what that needs to look like yet, given how much potential and how many different directions we have. Chris, did you want to add anything? Because I saw you had your virtual hand go up. Again. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to articulate that there's like a graph and then there's a map and I don't want to accidentally conflate the two in the sense of like when we're talking about something that is like reflecting real time activity uh, with nodes and edges, it also starts to drift into becoming a graph. Um, and that's where it's like a map can be a graph, but a map is not necessarily a graph. Whereas uh, a graph that is visually oriented is a map. Um, and that's where, like, we're, if we're just showing relationships and showing network relationships is not necessarily getting into the graph, node, edge, weight, and all that stuff, um, and what, like, activity and things like that. And further, I, I like there's a post on on the forum about the metaphysics of NFTs, and it's like directly relating to this in the sense of if you're trying to represent the real world with something digital, effectively because the translation from the real world to the digital is never going to reach zero energy. There's always going to be some sort of lag or some sort of um, rendering uh, like gap and it's never going to be a perfect one-to-one -one ratio but that doesn't mean you shouldn't do one so i think there's the notion of like you can't get a perfect one-to-one -one representation of the real world digitally just specifically because there's render latency like render latency your brain in fact makes it impossible for a person to experience real time because you have render latency in your brain so there's things about like nothing that has electrical signals can experience real world in real time because there's render latency, whether it's in your brain, whether it's in a computer, like electrical signals take energy and by proxy of that never being able to reach zero, there's always going to be some sort of latency, meaning we just can never get the map to update in real time perfectly. So like that doesn't mean we shouldn't do a map. And that's where I think in the sense of like, if we understand that physics makes it so that we can't make a perfect map that's updated to real time perfectly, it's never ever gonna correlate with real time, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't map connections and relationships. Um, so I think it's like, if we understand our limits, it makes our pursuits more uh, realistic. All right.
Thank you, Chris, for for the answer. Very thoughtful. Yeah, thank you for jumping in, Peter. Does anyone else have any other uh, any other questions or anything at this point? All right, cool. Well, I guess with that, I'm I'm happy to segue into right into the conversation uh, around what Stephanie had brought up earlier and just thinking about uh, what else this could possibly tie into is this open problems list. Because I think I shared at some point, uh, and I will show again, uh, thank you for dropping that in, Chris. Um, so as a result of some of the activities that took place at the Global Governance Gathering in Amsterdam, um, this file looks suspicious, does it? Does it look suspicious? Interesting warning, Google. Um, anyway, so we, we started uh, getting uh, an uncategorized problem list from a bunch of people who are in industry. Uh, started, uh, initially it was all obviously uncategorized, just this long list of problems. Uh, then in the weeks after that, some folks started coming together to actually start updating these by relevant content categories. And this is being collaborated on between uh, MetaGov Dow Research Collective and uh, SCRF. Um, and uh, yeah, so now these are getting actually categorized by different uh, research domains and topics. And uh, at the Web3 workshop that Quinn DuPont ran last week with a bunch of academics, uh, there was a, a, um, a subsection, I think, on economics and on, I'm forgetting which was the other subsection, but there were two continuations. Then at uh, Stanford Dow Day on September 1st, there was going to be uh, some kind of continuation of this. Uh, and generally thinking of where this goes from here. So we have you know, one problem list at a single point in time that we generated. We are also now starting to put together these kinds of open problems in different research areas for Web3 research, right? And how can we actually start getting a sense of you know, who wants to get this kind of information and is willing to share, who wants to join convenings with their peers in industry and academia, uh, and then Tell us about some actual open problems. And you know, we have some kind of we have one exam, we have a few examples here that we point to, but sort of what's an open problem, what's precluding that. Uh, you know, we ask for a few of these open problems. We hope from here we can actually get a bunch of people in a call to help us kind of iron out that open list of problems into a more focused roadmap of potential research, and then get that in front of researchers, get more, uh, you know, hopefully connect with funders in those directions who want to support those kinds of projects and and help collaborate around that. Right. So still unclear of where this is going to head. I know some folks very much want that, the output from that, right? The academics involved in that, they want a, a statement like an SOK or here is a view on this space and a certain date and point in time or whatever. From Skirf's perspective, like that's much less of a, of a goal. Like we're not worried about having a, another, uh, you know, published record or a, a, a something along those lines. But at the same time, thinking about how we do get more collaboration and involvement, how do we link this to the Skirf community that we have here? to cross-pollinators, to researchers, to uh, the various events that we can potentially get involved in. Because, uh, you know, to, to use this as a general sidestep into events for a moment, um, I feel like a pretty common complaint, especially considering like due to COVID, there was like a 12 to 18 month hiatus in most crypto events. And then like everything just blew up this year again, and they're all going like full force and bigger than ever and all that. Uh, Everyone seems to be conferenced out. Like, no, and I don't think this is new to like Web3. Like, anyone who's ever been to more than one conference gets like, wait, why are we all just sitting? Why do we spend like hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, to get in a room together and then stare? Right? Like, that doesn't feel like the best usage of all of our time. Like, we have to be able to do more things with that time, given how uh, limited our time and attention is. And so, I think a really powerful role that Scurf can play for the industry is to go to all of the largest event organizers. Right? We don't need to start putting on regular Scurf conferences. That's going to be its own massive beast and pain in the butt. We can go to all to the shelling points and the funding the commons and the dev cons and the, and go to all of them and be like, hey we're hearing from a lot of people that they want this continuity. You as organizers know from the feedback that you get that people want more hands-on functional oriented workshops, just it's in none of your actual incentives or interests to be the ones that connect the dot across multiple events because your problem is a single event or a series of events. 
So how can SCURF be that connective dot to add, you know, these facilitated workshops on sourcing open problems and then converting them to research questions and then converting those into a tech tree or a discourse graph of a long-term roadmap of problem of a research agenda for a specific topic area. And then from there, we create different subgroups for people to go into much narrower topics and have more focused outputs and all this feeds back to the public goods. And maybe they work on network maps, maybe they work on curricula, right? We also kind of have to see what people find most helpful in the first place. So to me, this kind of uh, building this open problem list and starting to go in that direction is the first attempt at how do we have a, uh, an event with concrete focused outputs and that we can create this connective thread across multiple events and keep open sourcing some of these outputs. Um, so yeah, that was on the open problem side. Any questions, thoughts, concerns around that before I give a quick thing on audit database if we have time? I'll just briefly mention on the audit database to try to have at least a little more time for, for chatting. Um, but basically, this started a while ago, the idea of how do we build an open uh, database and repository of known smart contract audits that are public. Uh, and so we've had uh, someone who's an undergrad in CS join us uh, through the last academic year, built two, uh, two scrapers, scraped two sources. Uh, we're looking through those at the moment. And now we're thinking of how do we capture the rest of the public stuff um, and kind of go from there. Um, so yeah, Pietro, that is, um, that is a good question that we are figuring out because SCURF does not technically own that, given that we are one of a few contributors there. Um, so anyone who does want to directly contribute, let me know and I'll get you plugged into that because we're still like joys of building communities. Uh, don't want to upset anyone. I just want to do a couple of checks, but the intention is to pull more people in. We're not trying to be exclusionary. It's just a lot of cooks in the kitchen. So just trying to figure out how to avoid surprises for people. So Pietro, please directly follow up with me. I'll get you connected open call to anyone. If you're like, hey, I have things I can add here. I want to be involved in this thing. Please get me plugged in. Uh, reach out to me and I'll, I'll figure this out. Hopefully in the future, we'll have a much more clean process for how to do this, but yay, first go around. Um, but yeah, so with this audit database project, basically, if we have a single database of all known publicly available audits in a single machine readable format, we can then start doing something that has existed in standard security, I think at least since the early 90s, if not earlier, of how do we automate detection of issues? <laughs> and especially because smart contract auditing is really smart contract code review, and we just have a much more robust name for a much more traditional function in the world of CS, um, right? Elements of that can be baked into compilers and where people code smart contracts. Elements of that uh, can be run through programs after code is compiled, right? Like there's all kinds of different cool things that can happen from a security research perspective. Um, but first there needs to be this database and right now no one is incentivized to build it. I, we recently had a conversation with one group that's building a pretty, uh, pretty big database that they do want to share publicly. So they're excited to collaborate with us on this and we got to have some follow-ups and they're aware of a few players that I did not know of who apparently have been building these proprietary data sets that they do actually intend to open source. So I'm hopeful that we can capture a good amount of these groups. And like, let's just all do it together as soon as we can. And right, we have this, this is another capstone project. So we're gonna have four to six grad students helping us with this. Like they can actually help us build out this database, make it usable, make it clean and interact with. And at least by the end of the year, we can have the first pass at this. And then we can have a much more insightful discussion on, well, what is the version of this that is most impactful for the industry and what needs to be put in place for us to be able to actually generate that to, to truly enhance the nature of smart contract audit security in the space. So definitely happy to add more color there. I see we're getting close to the tail end, so I'd be happy to leave the last five-ish minutes for chatting about any of that, about public goods and research. Uh, if there's a whole other direction you wanna throw us a curveball for the last few minutes, anything is fair game from here. So I'll be quiet for a little bit. Thanks, Pietro. Thanks for joining. Yes, Chris. I just want to point out that inevitably there's probably at least one or the other organization working on this, but because there's no public map, we can't we can't know. <laughs> for sure. For sure. So that that's where it comes right back down to the social networks. And like you just gotta to talk to enough people who know enough people who can then be like, oh, did you hear about them? They're doing the same thing. 
That's why it's funny even getting this like, you know, this peer review plus Web3 community. It's like, how big can that intersection be? Right? And like, first we found a few, there's every month there's one, two, three new groups popping up out of, you know, out of nowhere. And they've been around for months, at least, if not years. And yeah, it's just like, there's too much information for us to make uh, heads and tails of it until we have these maps and everything and AI layers over it to make sense of it and the humans and the tech and all that fun stuff. On which note, I am personally very excited at, once there are high quality uh, AI personal assistants that can sift through massive amounts of information and curate what is relevant for me in a way that I can program and control and not a third party controls. But uh, I have a feeling that's not anytime soon. So I'm not holding my breath on that one just yet. All righty. Well, I guess, you know, it seems like people don't have any particular questions about those projects. If you do ever want to chat about any of them in terms of getting involved and you haven't flagged interest in it yet, please make sure to reach out. Uh, if you know of other data sources available, especially in the smart contract audit direction, and you want to make sure we're considering that, that would be tremendously helpful. Uh, you know, we do have a couple minutes left. So uh, obviously happy to just give folks a few minutes back if that if, uh, if that is most desired, uh, but happy to just broaden it. You know, any anyone dealing with any kind of scurf elements they want to ask about? Uh, I know in general, the the world has been changing in many a way. So feel free to ask away what what's going on at scurf in any direction. But I see Paul has got his hand up, so please jump in. Yeah, I just wanted to use this little bit of time to one remind people to vote on the whether or not we are adding a community category to the forum. I put the link in the chat. Um, there's a discussion if you're interested in the background of it, but basically this is just a yes no vote um, of whether or not that should be a category that closes on the 29th. So you still have some time, but uh, probably every time I'm in a call and you see me in a call, uh, I will probably put that link to get people engaged with that. Uh, and then just on top of that, um, there are some really good pieces that have just recently hit the forum um, on decentralized governance of stable coins and Bitcoin privacy and um, unlimited approval of ERC-20 tokens on Ethereum that came from, uh, there's, these are summaries that came from the actual, or at least one of the authors of the piece. So it's an opportunity to engage with people who have done that research uh, on our forum as well. So um, I invite people to take a look at those. Uh, we'll put them in the community or the research section of the chat as well um, as part of just a reminder of what cool stuff is there. Um, but please join us in conversations around that, especially because the researchers themselves uh, will be hanging out in those threads. So that's just what I wanted to add. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, so please jump in and as Paul mentioned, vote on that one and let us know any any pressing thoughts you have in that post if you do have any that to be considered as people vote. Uh, but yeah, excited to, to see how that one plays out. Um, I will go vote instead of stating my opinion publicly. Um, yeah. Unless anyone has anything else, this probably does feel like a good time to break. So we'll go ahead and let everyone go. I'll hang out till the hour for all 60 or seconds remaining. But thank you for spending part of your day with us. Uh, and yeah, I hope you have a good rest of your morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are in the world.